Gay Dave is a fucking freak. He's a kaku whore, and I despise him. Welcome to Down Ballot. We do the show live every Tuesday, 7.30 p.m. Pacific, right here on Twitch. That's twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media. Flying solo tonight, Homo Leno, the councilman, is out on adventures. He'll be back next week with that astute analysis of what's going on here in the Bay Area. If you'd like to support this project, you can do that at patreon.com slash Echoplex. If you're watching on Twitch, you can always sub or throw bits. And, of course, we have our swag shop at eplex.store powered by fourth wall that's been one of the best things ever you can hit bang gift in the chat if you'd like to learn how to gift something to someone in the community during the show um tonight we have a guest on local love it's a singer songwriter his name escapes me i believe it's matthew torres though and uh, we got some of his music today and i believe uh, chip will be interviewing him and uh, we will also have a live performance from him so that should be great we will um, 
After the first of the year, we'll be changing things up a little bit on Tuesday. Uh, there may not even be a Tuesday stream. We're going to move some things around, kind of change what we're doing with Local Love. I'll have more information on that soon. Down Ballot isn't going anywhere. It might just go back to Fridays before uh, Conspiracy Bingo. Anyway, this is our local news show. We cover local news and events. Usually the councilman does the docket and organizes it into a few sections. If you uh, looked at the docket, um, if you looked at the show notes, if you're listening to the podcast, you notice that didn't happen. That's because I had a lot to do today and I'm lazy. But don't worry, at the end, we have the uh, open comments from the Shasta County Board of Supervisors meeting. So it will be fun. But first, let's, uh, let's kick it off with a story about Well, I think whoever this is is about to get kicked out of Palo Alto because they're doing something fun there, and uh, I think that's illegal. Now to Palo Alto, where Mondays have become the new Fridays for some restaurants in the downtown area. That is thanks in part to something that was missing before the pandemic, live music. KPI X5's Max Dara has the story of one musician who has found new purpose. This is what passion looks and feels like. And this is Micah Nutzi doing what he loves. It's so special. Up until the pandemic, he was a touring musician. Now, this low-key setup on Palo Alto's California Avenue is his main stage. It's the place you'll find him on Monday and Thursday nights. And he doesn't take a second of it for granted. This has definitely made a big difference in my life and my career. Like so many of us have at some point over the last few years, Anutsi lost his rhythm. When COVID struck, he lost 60 gigs overnight. He wondered if he'd have to give up his passion. I was scared because, you know, this is all I knew. And it almost happened. But his passion led him to purpose and Maiko Campilongo, who owns the restaurants Tarun and Italico on California Avenue. Everything happens for a reason. They needed help. A musician himself, Campilongo thought outdoor live music could provide that, and Anutsi would be the special ingredient. Well, about two years later, it turns out he was right. The numbers of a Monday night are very close to a Friday night. He says this year, Tarun is doing around 40% better than it did in 2019. There's no doubt that music brings business up. Another business on the block followed his lead. So you'll now find live music on Monday, Thursday, and Friday nights on California Avenue, bringing much needed life to the neighborhood. During the day, you see an empty street, sometimes kind of dead. At night, with the light, you see what it's been my dream for many years, replicating what happens in Europe. Anutsi has scaled down from loading up for big gigs to setting up his own little makeshift stage. But the change of venue allowed him to find his rhythm. It's really special. He's also found new purpose hey guys. in contributing to the community. How are you? When the businesses tell me that they appreciate it or that it's, it's helping the businesses grow and it's also helping the community have some joy and some really great experiences, that's what keeps me coming back. Take me home. A major change that no one could have seen coming, but he's thrilled with how the notes played out. I feel like I'm in the right spot. Country road. In Palo Alto, Max Dara, KPIX 5. Ladies and gentlemen, that is Michael Campilongo in the house. Palo Alto is like the last place I would have assumed that they would have had like music on the street on Monday night. But maybe the guy plays like an adult contemporary style of music. I don't know. It's maybe it's good. And like, whatever, if uh, people are out there listening to music and this guy's getting gigs, that's great. I wonder if he's available Tuesday and he'd like to come on local love. I feel like maybe he's too important for us now now that he has uh, been on the real news, but we'll see if we can reach out. I'll um, make a mental note of it. Uh, The media one, is good at that stuff. If he has like a Facebook or an Instagram or whatever, she's real good at that. So I guess that's kind of cool, but fuck Palo Alto. Um, We got, uh, an update from our election coverage, uh, evil Beto, that's, a uh, Matt Mahan, who's like, Hey dude, have you ever, did you ever know that you could buy a, buy a, a picture of a monkey for $5,000 and it's just a JPEG actually. If anybody was here for that night, that was one of the funnest nights on down ballot, watching him debate, uh, Cindy Chavez. Um, well, 
He won. Evil Bato won. And uh, here's a local news hit on the tragic victory of Evil Bato. Spoke with Matt Mahan about an hour ago. He told me he's excited to lead the city of San Jose and his first priority is budget accountability. As election results poured in for the neck and neck race at He's time, like, bro, have you ever balanced a checkbook or like had a startup, bro? Matt Mahan's lead over Cindy Chavez was just a few thousand votes, but Mahan maintained and grew his lead. And today, Cindy Chavez conceded the race. I think we ultimately prevailed because we gave voice to the frustration. He literally sounds like 50 percent Beto O'Rourke and 50 percent Mark Zuckerberg. Residents feel with the fact that they're paying some of the highest taxes in the country, and yet we're heading in the wrong direction on homelessness and crime. And blight. Cindy Chavez says she blight. Her opponent today blight. To get the fuck out of here. Him. San Jose is like one of the cleanest fucking big cities in the world. Blight. He's like, I, I saw a McDonald's wrapper on the ground the other day, bro. Um, she will continue to serve as a Santa Clara County supervisor for the next two years. I'm obviously disappointed. I wanted so um, much to be able to serve the residents of San Jose as mayor of San Jose. I'm blessed that I'm still on the board of supervisors, so I'm going to get an opportunity to continue to work on public safety and affordable housing and housing the homeless in particular. We asked her if she would consider running for mayor in two years. I would certainly consider it. So what will Mayhan's first priority be as mayor of a city of more than a million residents so like have you ever seen that movie the hunger games i ran on building a more accountable budget one where we are very clear about our goals where we measure the efficacy of our programs and we tie our pay raises to performance and i'm going to push hard on those priorities during the election none of mayhan's fellow council members supported him we asked him if he felt he has an uphill battle ahead when it comes to gaining support for his goals he says he has already reached out to council members to start talking with them about ways to improve the city Mayhan will take office in January, but he tells me he won't be tied to his office. He plans to get out into the community. In San Jose, Marianne Favreau, NBC Bay Area News. So he's going to like, if you ever seen RoboCop, remember that Ed 209 thing that just shoots everybody? That's what he's going to replace the police force with, I think. Because it's, did you know it could kill like a lot more people than just the cops, bro? Like, just send the Ed 209 to the homeless encampment. They'll just run. They'll never come back, bro. This is really bad news. That guy scares the living shit out of me. Legitimately, I'm terrified of Matt Mahan. Um, and I really feel like had maybe had maybe Andrew Yang stayed away from uh, Cindy, Cindy Chavez, she might have been able to pull it out. Because, uh, you know, he endorsed her and she put up a video with him. And I think that might have been like one of the reasons people didn't vote for her i mean i'm kind of kidding but i it seemed to me like that um that matt mahan would have been the uh, andrew yang kind of candidate because he like talks about common sense and shit and um i'm like real 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 hesitant and i get real real nervous when people who are running for office especially local government just start talking about common sense like as if it means anything because it doesn't mean anything like it never has meant anything. It's just like common sense when people say it, they legitimately mean b people who believe what I believe or believes what I believe. That's, and he was, he kept talking about common sense solutions. And it's like, dude, that doesn't mean anything. And all he's going to do, all he's going to do, I think, is go after the homeless encampments uh, in an aggressive way. And he's going to probably try to force people into treatment they don't want. And it's just going to be a mess. It's going to be a mess. Luckily enough, the other city council, the other members of the city council don't like him. And so I think it's going to make it hard for him to do any of the things he's thinking of doing. And so I think, it, I mean, at this point in a place like San Jose, where things are more or less kind of going okay. I mean, the homeless problem is a problem, but other big cities have a homeless problem, right? It's not like San Jose is unique in that. Compared to other cities, the size of San Jose, we're doing really well. Like the violent crime rate here is so low. Like, so I think, I think gridlock might be okay for a while, as long as nothing really bad happens that needs to be addressed. Uh, we shall see. So, um, there was that unfortunate event, <laughs> unfortunate is the wrong way to talk about. It. There was a tragic event in uh, Colorado Springs. Uh, the more we learn about it, the more we learn that one dude just fucking whooped that ass 
And uh, if not for that one dude who whooped that ass, I think that would have turned out much worse. Um, here's a, this is State Senator Scott Wiener from San Francisco. If anybody remembers when we covered Austin Bennett, Austin Bennett used to talk mad shit on this guy just because he's gay, basically. And, um, but he's gonna, he's kind of gonna talk about homophobia, anti-Semitism, and other things kind of being on the rise and uh, driving recent violence. I haven't heard what he says here, but I generally like what this guy has to say. And I, uh, let's check it out here. Dozens of people got together last night around Harvey Milk Plaza in San Francisco's Castro District with emotions ranging from deep sadness to extreme anger. Those attacks, that political rhetoric attacking our community has consequences. It fuels hate and violence. State Senator Scott Weiner is sounding the alarm about a rise in both homophobia and anti-Semitism. He opened up to our Lauren Toms about the ugly side of his job with the hope that it can shine a spotlight on the dangers of hateful rhetoric. It makes me really sad that in 2022 there are still people out there, a lot of people out there, who, who hate Jews who want us to disappear. State Senator Scott Weiner is no stranger to unsettling hate messages. As an openly gay Jewish lawmaker, he's made it a point to stand up for himself and his peers. I'm the tip of the iceberg. For every person who's public like me, who's getting these kinds of threats and comments, there are thousands of people that no one knows who they are and who they have no access to resources or no ability to really uh, show the world what's happening. But Wiener says anti-Semitism and homophobia directed at him has dramatically increased over the last several years, and he shared one particularly awful message he received just weeks ago. As a gay Jewish man, I, I represent like everything, almost everything that they uh, hate, um, and so so much of what they hate about you know people who don't fit their definition of how you're supposed to be. The spike in anti-Semitism has been noticed throughout the greater Jewish community. Security is clear at Temple Emanuel, where David Goldman has served as executive director for eight years. Once we start reacting out of fear, once we start closing our walls, we, in some ways, the battle has, has been lost a, a, a little bit. Certainly a higher level of concern, of frustration, of wonder what's really going on of sadness. Goldman says the temple has increased security and its relationships with local and federal law enforcement. But he says well, the cops ain't your friends, dude. Can happen. It has really fostered a sense of cooperation among all of those groups that I think is a is a good by itself. And that you can see a world where all of those groups feel more empowered because they're not alone anymore. As for Wiener, he says he will continue to stand publicly against hate and proudly in his identity to show others that hope trumps hate. I'm proud to be Jewish. I'm proud to be a gay man, and, and I will always fight for my community, uh, and I'll always, I'll never shy away from that. And I think it's really important for people not to hide their identities because they're concerned about how other people are going to react, because that just fuels uh, the, the, the hatred. Last year, the Anti-Defamation League reported a 34% increase in anti-Semitic incidents, marking the highest number since the ADL began tracking anti-Semitic behavior in the 1970s. Okay, so obviously State, State Senator Scott Weiner has been in the politics game for a long time. I remember when he was a Board of Supervisor talking about something similar here in San Francisco. So has he ever been actually worried that all of this hate spewed toward him could actually escalate into something physically dangerous. Well, Sarah, Senator Weiner told me that he is confident in local law enforcement, but of course, we all have parents who worry maybe a little bit more than we may worry ourselves. Mm -hmm. And he told me that it breaks his heart that his parents who were born in the Nazi era have to see this kind of hate particularly directed at their son. He said his mom even called him after the attack on Paul Pelosi last month and asked him to wear a bulletproof vest. Oh. But again, Scott has seen national attention for his legislation and pushback. Mm -hmm to hate and told me that he plans to continue to make his voice heard. All right, Lauren, thank you so much. We appreciate it. So Scott Weiner is actually one of the, one of the better uh, politicians. I think um, he was absolutely positively the first one to put out a public statement about uh, Austin Bennett assaulting Senator Richard Pan. And his statement was very much kind of what he was saying here he's like you know the rise in hate the rise in hateful rhetoric the rise in hateful rhetoric by extremist groups 
drives these kinds of attacks. And then he's talked about himself and how he's received threats and how he's sometimes been concerned for his own safety. And that, uh, you know, he kind of hoped that the assailant would be, uh, dealt with to the fullest extent of the law. As we learned with Austin Bennett, that did not happen. Um, we ended up stopping covering him because the, some of the people in the chat thought that maybe our arc with him was done. And I think they were right. But, um, you know, this, this guy's been one of the good ones. He's been always on the right side of this stuff and he's not afraid to open his mouth, not afraid to like say what he means. And I, I kind of wish, you know, people in the chat here were saying that I wish he, that they wish he would have mentioned transphobia. Uh, that might've been a good idea. Although like this guy has been a friend to trans people, uh, his entire political career and, um, his actions are speak much louder than his words. I wish in this segment, it would have been more effective if he would have na named a few names, if he would have named names like Matt Walsh, uh, libs of TikTok, uh, Tim pool. If he would have mentioned Elon Musk opening the floodgates for this stuff on Twitter. And maybe he did in that interview because it was clearly edited, but I wish that would have come out there because I don't think that, I don't think the average person knows what's going on and how, how this stuff starts, how it spreads and who the primary, who the primary purveyors of it are. Just this last week on the Sunday show, we watched multiple people from the Daily Wire come out and say that like no Republicans should ever vote in favor of gay marriage, even though like polling of average Republicans in this country show that they're in favor of gay marriage. So if your constituency is 60% in favor of something and then a piece of legislation comes up for it, you're going to vote for it unless you're just so blinded by bigotry that it doesn't that your bigotry outpaces your political ambition and i think there's some people that that's the case for and i think there's some districts maybe like marjorie taylor green's district where the polling skews the other way for the republican party but um you know scott wiener is one of the good ones and um i think his last name is unfortunate and i think we're not really ready for um no, we're not really ready for is the wrong way. This country isn't really ready for openly gay politicians to hit the next level for, for the next level for him would be like the house of representatives, the, the U S Senate, the governor. But I think he would be a prime. I think in my opinion, he would be a good candidate for those things. Unfortunately, there's a few factors beyond his control that are going to hold him back, not in his ability to do the job, but in his ability to get elected even here in California, unfortunately. So, since we're talking about hate, we're going to move all the way up north to Walnut Creek. Quite a drive from here. Quite a trip on the train from here. Um, there are some disturbing messages uh, being spread around in Walnut Creek. This is where those disturbing banners were displayed, right on this pedestrian walkway in the heart of Walnut Creek. Tonight, city leaders are strongly condemning it. It was like a gut punch to turn the corner and see that. Maya Borghetta describes how she felt seeing the pedestrian overpass near her home covered in banners with disturbing messages Saturday afternoon. They had slogans like, it's okay to be pro-white and white lives matter. They had um, signs encouraging people to go look up videos that went to um, Holocaust denial and racist videos and it was very disturbing. Borgetta, who is Filipina and Jewish, says she was so disturbed she posted her concerns and a photo on social media. We blurred out those hurtful messages. The news should not be blurring out these messages. At the beginning, go, hey, you know, there's going to be some disturbing messages in this video. If your kids are around, maybe it's not the time for your kids. But the news needs to not blur these messages out because now people don't know what it said. But they definitely caught the attention of a lot of folks. So when I was driving home, I saw a sign across the top of the bridge that said uh, it is OK to be pro-white. I uh, thought it was a really abrasive sign. It's not something you really expect here in Walnut Creek. These are all not something you expect. Oh, God, that guy has some of the pamphlets. Look at that vile leaflets that we've seen dropped in other Bay Area communities. Over Just a few weeks ago, City Councilman Kevin Wilk publicly condemned the discovery of anti-Semitic leaflets discovered in neighborhoods on the border of Walnut Creek and Concord. He's equally outraged about the banners. But it's the exact same type of things that we've seen from the Nazis. These are today's Nazis. The mayor says police are investigating the case. This type of messaging is not welcome in Walnut Creek. Walnut Creek doesn't tolerate hate speech 
or hate messaging of any kind. It is that mayor go, and if you come back, fuck around and find out. He's like, I'll be there next time you come back. <laughs> who we are as a community. It's absolutely a hate crime. These are the kind of things that hate crime was made for. Because even this isn't a crime. Has limitations. In Walnut Creek, Jody Hernandez, NBC Bay Area News. So that's hate speech, but unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, depending on how you look at it, um, hate speech isn't illegal in the United States. Protected under the First Amendment, it's been ruled that way over and over and over again. Um, I do. So I think that, unfortunately, the only way to deal with this is those people come back. The neighbors just need to just walk up that bridge and just run them off. I don't know what you can't do anything else. Cops can't do anything. It's not illegal. So I guess maybe the people, good people of Walnut Creek need to fucking take matters into their own hands. Do a little neighborhood watch on that shit because I don't know what else to do. And, um. You show up with enough people, you don't even need to, no violence needs to happen because you show up with a couple hundred people and there's like eight of them up there. They're just going to, they're going to split. They're going to leave. That's it. So we're going to move back down here to the South Bay. This is over in Saratoga or one of these instances in Saratoga right next to where I used to live, but not only in Saratoga, there were some uh, problematic dolls found at schools. We begin tonight with a disturbing investigation in the South Bay. Dolls in nooses found at several South Bay schools. In the latest incident, a staff member found a doll with dark skin hanging from a noose in a tree in the quad area of Redwood Middle School in Saratoga. NBC Bay Area's Hilda Gutierrez. Has okay, that's a place I don't expect this shit. Walnut Creek, I'm like, well, Walnut Creek's pretty Tony White, and it's at the edge of the Bay Area where out, after you get outside of Walnut Creek, it starts being l- uh, less dense. But down here, it's dense where this is. This is like Saratoga. It's like a it's like a rich area, but it's it's dense and there's not like a lot of rural area around there. There's no room for rural area around Saratoga. It's all like wineries up in the hills next to it. Action from parents and the school district. It has not been a typical day here in Redwood Middle School. Parents are having to have very difficult conversations with their children as the sheriff's department investigates a very serious hate crime. A small doll with dark complexion in a noose was found hanging from a tree on the Redwood Middle School campus. And similar incidents were reported at two nearby high schools over the weekend. Saratoga High and Prospect High School, according to Santa Clara... We used to live right next to Prospect. ...deputies who are investigating all three incidents. As diverse, right, as we see, there are people who have a different opinion. So this is definitely... uh, 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 example to that. This parent has students at two of the schools where the incidents happen. We asked her why she thinks this happened at Redwood Middle School. The truth is, it happened after the first initial shock. We were like, hey, it's actually a re- reality check, right? Why not? It's not happening here. A staff member discovered the doll and news Tuesday morning, according to the letter sent to parents from the Saratoga Union School District. The sheriff's office issued a statement urging the public to report any leads regarding who may have purchased several dark complected dolls recently, adding, hate has no place in Santa Clara County. The sheriff's office will thoroughly investigate these incidents and request the prosecution of the offenders to the fullest extent of the law. It's an unfortunate event, but I really hope by the school district and parents and kids, we actually good, get a good lesson out of this. From Saratoga, Hilda Gutierrez, NBC Bay Area News. So because these were hung on a school campus, I think there are like things that law enforcement or the government can do because there's you give up a lot of your rights, whether you're a student or you're just me or you walking onto a school campus, right? Like you just give up a lot of your rights because we've decided that that's a place where you don't have a right to go and yell or whatever. So in this case, if they figure out who did it, that person might end up like having some trouble with the law, but it's going to be some misdemeanor shit. And it's not really going to stop anything. In fact, like that person might get a spot on Tucker Carlson if we're being completely honest here, right? Because like, that's just kind of the direction we're headed in is that, that there's a whole, there's a whole media apparatus out there. That's like, well, why are you being so hard on these people? Like if it's like a 16 year old, it's like, oh, it's just a kid. It's just a kid. It's just a kid. Well, that's when you got to nip that shit in the bud. Actually, if it's just a kid. That's, that's when you can stop it at its source. 
And if it's an adult, then that's fucking disgusting. Honestly, and that person, I don't know. I don't, there's probably tons. I probably actually tons of laws around me going onto a school campus and doing anything. So it's bad news, bad news all around the Bay area, I guess. In a bit of good news, a bit of schadenfreude here. We covered this on uh, our tech show on uh, Monday, though the tech show hasn't come out. It comes out tomorrow. Elizabeth Holmes was sentenced to a little over 11 years in prison for her fraud in uh, being the CEO of the company Theranos. If you don't know about the company Theranos, there's, there are a lot of great documentaries about there and you, out there about it, and you can learn more yourself. Um. What a day. Yeah, I mean, the emotions in there are just so raw. Everyone got silent in the courtroom. The judge gave kind of a long speech about how fraud is not an excuse for what goes on here in Silicon Valley. Uh, He sentenced her again to slightly more than 11 years. Uh, We are just about to get the surrender date. Um, So she will not be taken to prison right now. Mm -hmm. Um, But, uh, you know, everyone just was silent after. You know, you did such a good job of setting the scene and letting us know, like, kind of the emotion. But a tweet doesn't speak, you know, the volumes that you can. And to see that she was on the the stand and she was crying and really kind of begging for forgiveness. Yeah, she did get her chance to speak. And again, we had seen her speak during the trial and she was quite compelling uh, and at times emotional. Uh, She got up today, gave a much shorter talk, uh, apologizing very contrite to her investors, to her uh, family, to her employees, saying she realized she did things wrong. Um, I don't think it swayed the judge. 11 years seems like something kind of on the high side um, from what I've been hearing from, from lawyers and legal analysts. That's not true. This guy's incorrect. The The high side of that would have been 25 years. I believe the, the sentencing guidelines were 11 to 25 years, not the 11 wasn't the top. 11 was the bottom. Um, that's just I think that's just incorrect. But yeah, it was uh, very emotional and very quiet when she finally got her chance to speak. And even before she spoke, uh, the father of Tyler Schultz and the son of George Schultz, who was the investor, Tyler Schultz, the whistleblower, uh, spoke looking directly at Elizabeth Holmes and saying, you know, uh, among the more. I think that's George Schultz, a former uh, Ronald Reagan or George H.W. Bush advisor. The reason this lady got fucked is because she took a bunch of money from powerful people like Henry Kissinger. And uh, George Schultz's son comments was you've heard a lot about Sonny Balwani being the bad guy. Elizabeth, you were the Sonny Balwani to my family. Uh, And he said that through tears, too. So this was a case, uh, a trial that ended in tears. What can I say? I I think that that was really powerful because a lot of people were saying, oh, so she defrauded rich people. Rich people parted with their money willingly and they should have known better. But to hear that this young man, this whistleblower, really suffered that consequence and really created a rift in the family, too. It really did. You know, the father spoke about how that rift was caused from grandfather to him, to his son, the Theranos employee, Tyler Schultz, and how it really ripped them apart because they didn't know who to trust. Because George Schultz, who we all know is a former Secretary of State, great, you know, great man. Oh, not just an advisor. He was the Secretary of state that's why she got that's why she got convicted and that's why they went after her in the beginning she she went after she went after power she like defrauded powerful people um and big time investor trusted elizabeth over the words of his own son and that caused a big rift and so the 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 middleman and all this the you know tyler's father uh was was quite broken up about this and he clearly blames elizabeth holmes you know the interesting thing is that you know why should we believe a kid who's telling us that it's not working, yet people believed a kid saying that it was going to work. It's a very good point. I mean, we believe young people here in Silicon Valley. We give them hundreds of millions of dollars to do what they do. In this case, it almost should have been a warning that Elizabeth Holmes investors were not young people with tech experience, but they were, let's say it, men of a certain age yes. without tech experience but, but with- these weren't like these weren't like your 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 peepa who's posting like screeds on facebook these were like former secretary of state and like known war criminal henry kissinger like- political experience and with influence and with connections but really it says something that biotech investors and venture capitalists from Silicon Valley stayed away from Theranos. And that should have been a big warning to people who either went to work or went to invest in the company. And that's why it was so powerful to have you in, in the, you know, in the courtroom because you have been following tech and you know that not everybody was throwing money at her. 
No, uh, there were a lot of people, especially uh, female executives in Silicon Valley, who were very angry by this, that, wait a minute, she's committing fraud. She is doing to us reputational harm. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of venture capitalists in Silicon Valley who, over the last year and a half, told me this is what we were staying away from. You can observe a young person who drops out of college to do something, but until they deliver anything, it's very risky to put money there, especially the biotech VCs who said we just didn't see any results coming from Theranos from the get-go, and that's why they refused to invest in her company. I, I thought it was powerful that the judge also said, you know, it's, the sad thing is that she is quite brilliant. I mean, maybe she could have done something different. Did you this shit, right? Oh, she's quite brilliant. A great mind lost. I mean, I don't care if you're brilliant, if, if what you're doing is lying to everybody. She was like basically trying to run around telling everybody she made the iPhone of medical devices. Trying to tell people you could take a drop of blood and just do all these tests on it versus like when you have your blood drawn for, for medical tests, they draw kind of a lot of it because each different test, it kind of ruins the sample. And she just went around lying to people. The judge did say that. And, and I think even those who were testifying against her didn't testify against her to say you had no idea what to do with our money. What they said was you were doing the wrong things with our money. You knew that what you were doing was wrong and you kept on doing it. A lot of people who observed this trial told me what they could not forgive was not taking large money from investors, but putting those machines in Walgreens knowing that they were inaccurate and what that did to many patients. And we've seen a lot of people showing up, members of the public and perhaps other investors because they wanted to see what happened. She wasn't convicted of defrauding them though, but they still felt defrauded. They did and I think uh, the judge even touched on that. There's a culture here in Silicon Valley where we want young people to do well and we feel betrayed when they betray our trust and so right, but that's i don't i don't know how the judge framed it because we don't have video but like that's a problem we shouldn't just think that oh well you know what we want is all the founders all these companies to do well why would we want that don't we like if, if, let's say like silicon valley is a fiercely capitalistic place so if we were like fiercely capitalistic and maybe ethical you'd think that we would want people who had good ideas and ideas that would like help people get shit done, we'd want them to thrive. But we don't just want any old person to, th we wouldn't just want any old person to thrive because they raised some money and claimed they had a box. So there are many reasons you can say why this case became such an international sensation. She's a young woman. She was attractive. She was very smart. Dropping out of Stanford to start a company, it's very audacious. Getting all this investor money, it all comes together. Also, Let's face it, people like to sometimes see someone taken down a peg or two, as she and Theranos were. I mean, I'll say that this is schadenfreude, but like, also, like, she fucking ripped a bunch of people off and put a machine in the Walgreens that don't work. Like, it wasn't rich people going into Walgreens to get their blood work done. This case had it all, but yeah, I think a lot of people did feel betrayed because this is, for a while, what Silicon Valley gave its attention to, and unlike many of the other companies and inventions and innovations this one didn't pan out yeah no most companies and inventions and innovations don't pan out we we heard a lot about her pregnancy people saying whatever about it you know did she do it on purpose did she try to get sympathy whatever we know that the judge said you can stay seated if you want because right. you're pregnant did it did it play in in any other way you think um as far as the decision i don't think so except i'm guessing that her surrender date will be into next year so that she can have the child and spend some time with it um but an 11.25 year sentence when you have an infant and what will be a one year one one or two year old is very significant to any parent and so you've got to think that that like tons of tons of people get convicted of crimes when they have young kids or are pregnant they don't just get like a year off to like push their sentence back so, no to play all that much it was less than what the prosecution wanted they asked for 15 years but it was much more than what her side asked for and it was more than what the probation board recommended what did the judge say about that her side asked for lower than the guidelines it's a very good point he said he took that nine years into account and a matter of fact fairly early in what he was saying he said you know i always take very seriously what the probation board says so a lot of us were sitting whoa is this going to be a nine-year sentence and that's what made the end a little more surprising closer to nine than 15. the nine-year recommendation into account and saying how much faith he put into that he added more than two years to the sentence so 11 years and three months 
at a later date. We're going to find out today what that surrender date is? Yeah, I, I think it's mid-year. Um, I can check right now. <laughs> Everything's been tweeting back and forth. I just ran downstairs to talk to you. But yes, I do know it's, it's months into the future. Uh, April, thank you. It's April 27, and so thank you. We do know it's April 27. So if you do the math, that gives some time, not a whole lot of time. I mean, we've had children, but uh, but it gives some time. Um, and, and then from there, uh, you know, it's, it's obviously going to be tough. It is more time than some women get with their babies. Yes, yes right? indeed. Um, and, 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 yes, yes. If she was, if she was uh, poor and convicted of just having some cocaine, she would have just been taken right out of the courthouse into jail. So what happens next? What happens next is, uh, uh, you know, we hear, I think, from both sides, it's interesting that both sides of this trial, and probably after the Holmes trial, declined to speak because they had another one coming right up with Sonny Balwani, also from Theranos. Um, and Elizabeth Holmes' attorneys haven't talked, and I have a feeling that they knew their strategy was going to be to pull this, uh, you know, drag this out for a long time with, uh, with various attempts to either have a new trial or, or reject this one. Um, now that all that has passed, I, I imagine we'll be hearing from both sides now um, on, on what they hope to see. Uh, and as for Holmes herself, I mean, you know, it's, it's getting ready for a long stretch. Right. And I think a lot of people did want to hear from her. We're not allowed to take cameras into a federal courtroom. So, you know, all the words that we have from her are from you and written. Um, is there anything that you think she could say to the public that would change? I mean, there, there's nothing to change here, right? But right. would there be any reason for her to speak publicly? I mean, this is exactly half a lifetime ago for her, right? And so for her to say, I'm sorry, for her to say, I feel terrible about how this turned out at the time. So that was a weird place for it to cut, but uh, the feed for the local news was also kind of choppy and bad there. This is, I don't know, I don't know, I don't like the way the local news has been covering this. It's, they like almost feel sorry for her, but like, dude, I just think of all the people going through, and it's not the federal courthouse, it'd be the county courthouse, who have just a little bit of cocaine or even some meth or whatever, which I really don't like. Some, you know, f fucking barbiturates or, or opiates. They don't get this, they don't get this treatment from the media. They don't get anybody being like, oh, oh, well, uh, you have a young kid, I guess we'll let you wait to surrender. No, they just take like after they're, after they're convicted and sentenced, they just taken in, into custody and they start their sentence. It's just the way it goes. So on to some more, uh, onto some less depressing news here. We got a, a, a topless, uh, nightclub in San Francisco was actually named to the legacy business list for the city which is pretty cool actually i don't think a lot of cities are uh, gonna do that the condor club has been flashing its bright lights on broadway and flashing customers for decades oh uh, you had to do it that was the low-hanging fruit i bet your producer told you not to do it but you did it good for you the gentleman's club is a north beach staple and a part of san francisco history and now it's getting a nod from the city's small business commission this week it became the very first adult entertainment venue to become part of san francisco's legacy business list an honor it's more than just bragging rights for the club's gregarious owner and the people who rely on it to pay their bills. she called it a gentleman's club but then you saw in the in the video that half of the patrons were women this, the, the gentleman's club is like an outdated term for this, and I don't think we should be using it. Some people uh, don't understand what happens in, in the club, don't understand how it works. <laughs> to be a world-class city, you need world-class entertainment, and that's not always just the opera or always the symphony. Strip club owner Joseph Karuba and your grandmother might have something in common. Antiques. Joseph loves them. He says owning the Condor Club in North Beach is kind of like having one. And because it's so old, you realize that you're just going to have it for a short period of time. You're really the cure, you know, you're there to just take care of it. You know, you've paid for the privilege to take care of that, that piece and then, to, and, and then to give it to somebody else. So that's the Condor. The club has been around since the 1950s, but it wasn't until 1964 that the Condor got famous, or infamous, when it became the first fully topless club in America. This is not, you know, it's not a museum where you go in and it talks to you about the Barbary Coast. This is a living remnant 
of that time. Let's start at the beginning. Carol Dota was a cocktail waitress. If the Condor is a museum, Carol Dota would be the Mona Lisa. North Bay filmmakers Jonathan Parker and Marlo McKenzie chronicled her story for an upcoming documentary, Topless at the Condor. Well, Carol Dota was the first topless dancer in the nation in 1964. Show business is very, very hard. You have to be on your toes all the time. She was the girl on the piano, and then the clubs were all competing with each other for, for business. This was the big nightclub scene in San Francisco at the time on Broadway, and so they rigged the piano to lower from the ceiling. Her top came off and the crowd followed, but so did the outrage. San Francisco police raided the Condor in 1965. Parker says Dota's bold move was like pouring gasoline on the fire that would erupt into the summer of love and the sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s, a major point of pride all these years later for Joseph and his staff. Just Condor in its own, there's no other place that's the very first topless club in America, it's us. But the Condor's storied legacy almost ended abruptly just two years ago when the lights on Broadway went dark. This is KPIX 5 News. We are directing that all bars, nightclubs, wineries, brew pubs, and the like uh, be closed in the state of California. Life as we know it will change drastically once midnight strikes. There was no way the Condor Club was going out of business. And more Californians filed for jobless benefits last week. Yeah, we were in trouble. Yeah, we were we were in trouble. COVID shutdowns devastated the industry, and Joseph struggled to keep the business alive, relying on a PPP loan from the government to try and keep his employees. I'll be back. After two years of navigating pandemic restrictions and a major economic slowdown, the Condor got an unexpected boost when District 3 Supervisor Aaron Peskin agreed to nominate the club to San Francisco's Legacy Business List, a program aimed at helping prop up historic businesses in the city. To qualify, businesses must have operated for at least 30 years straight and land a recommendation from the Historic Preservation Commission. Joseph and his manager made their case to the city. He got up there in front of the commission and he said, he said, uh, you know, they you ever saw that show Cheers? Yeah, it's like that except striptease you know so it's like a it's a, like a naked cheers you know it's like a <laughs> that's pretty funny the condor will do you think norm is a lot more than the dollar bills thrown on the stage actual help from the city including marketing a grant to help the club secure a long-term lease an eventual plaque and the pride of being north beach's only adult entertainment venue on the list to feel like a validation not just for me but for uh for carol dota for the people that got busted here for the original owners who were North Beach, you know, just some kids from North Beach that were trying to make good. It felt like validation for all those guys, not just us. Thanks for playing Joseph copyrighted music. To the first owner thanks. of the Condor, nor will he thanks, be the last. CBS News Bay he isn't area. even the most well-known. But as its steward, he's hoping the support from the city will help him preserve his small slice of San Francisco history, even if it's only his just for now. Now that we've got this legacy status, we'll be here many years after I'm no longer around. And but we can look back and go, hey, Joe did a pretty good job, you know, take care of it while um, while he had it. All right, I've never seen the guys in the studio pay such close attention to a story I've done. Come on. See that for a change. Well, the owner says he's planning on negotiating a new lease for the building soon, and he's glad the city is going to help with that. <sighs> the way they covered that, first of all, calling it a gentleman's club, I mean, it was belied by the, the fact that you looked in the audience and there were a lot of men and women there. Strip clubs have changed a lot, um, and this one in particular, because of its history and its legacy, is... Not what people used to think of or whatever when they think of a strip club. This is a kind of a fancy place that you go. It's not cheap to buy drinks there. Sometimes it's hard to get in. It's not, <clears throat> it's not like what people think about sort of historically when they think about strip clubs. It is a monument in San Francisco. It's a, like a cultural thing. And I'm glad the city of San Francisco or whatever private organization, I don't know if, if it was the city or if it was a private organization that puts this together, they were willing to. Uh, do this because it's going to piss a lot of people off a lot of people that we like to piss off around here so that's good another story about a strip club out of san jose a fire a fire 
engine stopped at one or something. I don't know. I don't, I don't watch the, the clips before we run the show, but there was a, <laughs> this is probably a great story. They're probably going to paint it as if it's like some horrible fucking thing. Well, let's see what's going on here. Snout on NBC Bay Area investigation involving a San Jose fire truck, a strip club, and a bikini clad woman who stepped out of the fire truck and into the club. NBC Bay Area has she needed a ride. obtained exclusive new information after filing a Public Records Act request. Our Damien Trujillo joins us from outside the Pink Poodle with a story you'll see only on NBC. Okay, the Pink Poodle is a trashy fucking place. Bay Area. <laughs> The information gathered from this investigation has been slow in coming, but what we have reviewed is very troubling. The video posted on social media shows a woman in a bikini climbing out of San Jose Fire Engine 4 and into the Pink Poodle Gentlemen's Club on Bascombe Avenue. After we brought the video to the attention of the mayor and the fire department, the city launched an investigation, but that's the last we've heard from them. Richard Santos is a retired San Jose fire captain of 33 years and says he's getting... What if we find out that lady's a firefighter and had to, like, she was going about her business as a firefighter and, like, had to work late or whatever and just changed her clothes and got a ride to the fire truck? Like, anything's possible. ...with the progress of the investigation. Well, like anything, you sure hope there's a thorough investigation, but the longer they wait, it, it hurts everybody who like to have this behind us. Because the men and women, though, of the San Jose Fire Department deserve better. So we have why? What? what the, but all she was doing was wearing a bikini and walked from the fire truck to a, a, a business that legally operates in San Jose. With the city of San Jose to get Engine Four's GPS location data for that evening, along with other public information related to the incident. Here is some of what we found. According to dispatch records, there was never a call for service at the Pink Poodle that night. But at 9:06 p.m. GPS data shows Engine 4 stopped in front of the Pink Poodle. The engine then appears to circle the block before returning four minutes later at 9.10. Then at 9.14, the GPS pings two miles away, showing Engine 4 stopped in front of AJ's Bikini Bar. GPS data shows the engine was there for about four minutes. Is there an error in judgment? So be it. We got to deal with it. It doesn't take away from the 100 percent that they give every day for the citizens of the city of San Jose. We also obtained text messages between city leaders on the night we alerted them of the video. They show leaders scrambling to get a message out to the media. A text from the fire department spokeswoman questions the message should be mind your own business. Writing in a statement to NBC Bay Area that, quote, heads must roll and we can't have an emergency rescue apparatus relegated to a frat party bus. There was no response today from the mayor. We can't tell how the chief was responding much of the time because some of his text messages were redacted without any explanation, which NBC Bay Area plans on challenging. In a short statement today, the city would only say this is an ongoing investigation that includes all the data they have. The fire department did not release the names of the firefighters on duty at Station 4 that night, citing the ongoing investigation. Santos says he's worried about the blemish the entire incident has left on the San Jose Fire Department. Damian Trujillo, NBC Bay Area News. I don't know, it looked to me like she was just getting a ride to work. I mean, maybe she's, like, like people who work at these kinds of places are friends with people. Maybe one of her friends is a firefighter and she, like, needed a ride to work. He's like, this is a little unconventional, but uh, maybe we can just give you a ride to work. Who fucking knows? But I bet, like, one, I bet either what's going to happen here is we're never going to hear about this again. Or two, if we hear about it again, it's going to be, like, fucking mundane. It's going to be, like, the most boring explanation you've ever heard. Because they were, she was in the truck for five minutes. Okay. They had, they, had, they went around the block. Who, who fucking knows what happened? Anyway. As has been our tradition here lately, we're going to do a video about a uh, vehicle versus building. This is in uh, Saratoga, California, uh, where they were. Uh, we had a slightly more troubling story earlier. Uh, this is well. This is troubling too. Here's a truck crashing into a house in Saratoga. A scary morning for a Saratoga man. This truck plowed all the way through his home and into his neighbor's yard, and he lived to tell about it. It was a dangerous scene, but of course, it could have been much worse. NBC Bay Area's Robert Honda joins us live from outside that home in Saratoga. So far, it looks like this, this time the vehicle won. Talking to the owner, and wow, what a crazy day for him. 
Well, that's right, Janelle. And right away, we want people to know that nobody was seriously hurt here, although anyone looking at this scene here on Montpere Way in Saratoga might be surprised by that. For the homeowner, it'll take a while to repair the damage and to emotionally process what happened. I, I couldn't make any sense of it. Jeff Daniels is still reeling after a driver in a white truck crashed through his garage and home, careening off a neighbor's car, which was the only thing that kept it from hitting that second home as well. The crash was so loud, it was initially reported to the fire department as an explosion. Oh yeah, the whole door blew off the hinges and flew in. You can see the wall is caved in a little bit right there, right? How close would you say you were to where it happened? 20 feet max. Wow. Yeah. Then I, well, I mean, how far, I mean, that, the guy, it's, you know, it's just a regular single family home from one end of this place to the other. How far is it? Back there, and it's kind of disorienting to see something like that, right? For neighbors, too. And I heard a loud boom. I uh, wasn't sure what it was. I back up to Highway 85. I assumed it was an accident on the freeway. Uh, and I thought, well, we're going to hear sirens soon. And uh, once we started to hear the sirens, I realized they were in my front yard instead of my backyard. The fire department points out this kind of accident may be rare, but when it does happen, steps must be taken to keep it from becoming a disaster. People need to be mindful that the electricity and the gas to the building can be compromised. Um, and so anytime you have an accident like this, you need to be mindful of that. My wife and kids are all out of town. No, I was the only one home. So that was good. What are your thoughts as you look at it? Uh, I'm glad I did my laundry yesterday <laughs> because I might have been in the garage. Now that really could have changed things, but as you could tell, Jeff is being philosophical and trying to do whatever it takes to be able to celebrate Thanksgiving at home. The Sheriff's Department is now investigating how and why it happened, and we're also told that the driver was taken to a hospital and treated for non-life-threatening injuries. Live in Saratoga, Robert Honda, NBC Bay Area News. I suppose, if I had to guess, alcohol. But you never know. Maybe fell asleep at the wheel. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, the guy whose house it was seems to have a good attitude about it. And, like, honestly, if that happened to your house and uh, you're trying, you're worried about Thanksgiving, just go out to dinner. You deserve it. Go somewhere nice. <laughs> Make the guy who ran his $80,000 truck into your garage pay for your dinner. Go to Scott's. Scott's is a nice place. And uh, it's be very difficult for somebody to run their vehicle into Scott's. Um, so that's the Bay Area news for the evening. But we're going to head up north, head up north to Shasta County. I've gone ahead and clipped out just the public comment section of the Shasta County Board of Supervisors. And uh, as you well know, the shit sometimes gets spicy. It's also on Odyssey, so it sometimes won't start. Thank you, Chairman of the Board, Board of Supervisors, for putting this before the community so we can have a thoughtful conversation about it. I appreciate all of your input that you have added to this. I work at Shasta Community Health Center as the director of the HOPE program, and I'm an active member in our local advisory board for the continuum of care. I just wanted to add a couple m points in support of uh, moving forward with the homely homeless housing assistance and prevention money. This is an opportunity to support ongoing and new projects to address homelessness, which I know is important to all of our constituents. This also gives us the opportunity to coordinate strategic resources between local, county, city, and nonprofits to meet our community's specific needs. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Amber. Robert, to be followed by Megan, please. That was like a reasonable person talking to the Shasta County Board of Supervisors. I'm stunned. This is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Don't worry, the next person will probably be a wackadoodle. Well, Morning, board. Thanks. It looks like I didn't even need to come because everyone it seems to be a, a consensus. So I appreciate that. I'm definitely for supporting the um, the letter and continuing with the funding uh, for our own county and for the surrounding counties. Um, you know, obviously, I don't think government is the answer in, in the big picture, but we have no alternatives right now, and this is uh, clearly the best uh, solution. Um, Mary had mentioned about, you know, closing state hospitals. or I don't know if it was state that she was talking about, but we had state hospitals here, and they were a good thing because it took a lot of the pressure off the local jurisdictions. Um, 
But well, that's for another time. Uh, I'm definitely in support of this, so thanks. Thank you, Robert. Megan, to be followed by Brenda, please. Oh, I know who Bre- Brenda's going to say something crazy. I don't know who Megan is, but we know Brenda. Hello, my name is Megan Priller, and I'm representing a local nonprofit who I have a foster family agency, and then we also have a host homes program, which um, is designated for 18 to 24-year-old homeless youth. Um, And really, we just look for individuals and families in the community to kind of help us come together and temporarily house our youth as we help them into more permanent housing. Um, And I can just speak for a lot of the nonprofits, and this, this funding stream is how we are here today and how we can continue to do the work work that we're doing. Um, without the HAP1 and HAP2 funding, our program would not exist. Um, and so I just, I agree. Obviously, it sounds like you agree with what we're... This is disappointing. I don't think anybody's going to throw a chair or anything. I'm hopeful for in continuing this, um, but also being able to um, fill the gaps that we've found as we've started this program over the last few years and kind of where there's still a big need. Um, our homeless youth are kind of the invisible population of homeless um, in our community, and it's it's not a small population. And so we're taking a preventative and proactive approach to help avoid them from becoming chronically homeless and kind of help them become um, successful members of our community. So thank you for your time. Megan, while you're here, I'll just thank you for years of investment in our foster children and uh, ask at-risk youth the opportunity to assist them in the healing and the safety process. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. And I just wanted to comment, too. I popped up here. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for the work that you do. Transitional age youth, TAY, is a a very vulnerable population. It's so important to intervene. Okay, that's great. Somebody scream about ivermectin or something. They can take that right fork in the road instead of the wrong fork in the road. So thank you for the work you do. It's really important. And um, I applaud you and all the other nonprofits that have focused on that particular age group. Thank you. Thank you. Brenda, to be followed by Monique, please. Good morning. I didn't really want to be here, so I was going to take a break from this stuff for a while, and I'm pretty sure you know that's pretty obvious why. Um, So, Mr. Chimenti, I want to thank you for um, making the comment that we do need to come together. You know, the past few years, it just seems like it's been a lot of fighting, no compromise, no communication. You know, it's time to come together. And that means every area that we represent, whether it's Anderson, I don't know how far it reaches, but whatever the seven communities you're talking about or counties, um, I think we need a bigger think tank to combat this homeless issue. On the mental health side of it, I can speak on that because my daughter obviously was mentally ill. Um, The 52 beds you are talking about, I'm assuming that's Crestwood Regional Rest Pad. Um, Unfortunately, all those beds require a 5150 and and or a conservatory. Um, So that kind of leaves out people that just want to walk in and get treatment. I've heard about some other programs that are happening now that I don't agree with. I don't have time to talk about it today because I want to do more research on it. But you have mentally ill people and you have drug addicts. You have mentally ill people that have drug addiction and alcoholism on top of it. So they don't all belong in the same box and you can't treat them in some of the same things they're doing right now. Whoa, even Brenda's like not off the leash. Um, And as we know, gravely disabled is here to get somebody conserved or to get somebody on a 5150. We have no inpatient programs here. We have no dual What on earth is going to happen to this channel if the Shasta programs, County Board of Supervisors becomes a productive really thing for the community? really important to treat people like my daughter and others like her. She was unable to do an inpatient or an outpatient program. Once you get them outside of the door, it's like squirrel. You know, whatever's in their head, whatever they get distracted with, that's where they go. They will not come back on time <laughs> if they come back at all. Um, so, yeah, I, I believe we just really need to come together. And as far as this funding goes, we need a bigger think tank. All agencies need to come together and put their ideas in before we start spending money because it's this all the time. Pilot programs failing. You know, they come for six weeks, six months, maybe a year, and then they're over. I just think we need a bigger, a bigger think tank. Um, the rapid housing... People are homeless because they can't afford it. (laughs) The criteria for renting is so high, it's insane. If I was to 
lose my job or my husband was to lose his job, we would be homeless. We wouldn't be able to afford to do anything. And we have three kids to raise. You know, So I would like to be a part of this process and put some input in. And, you know, the Hope Band is really important to reach out to the homeless. Dr. Patton's my hero. He was the only one that ever could build a rapport for my, with my daughter. I don't want to see one more person die on the street, being ran over by accident, dying from, you know, their health issues or whatever. So I'm on board for whatever. So let's get together and just make this happen. Thank you, Brenda. Thanks. Supervisor Rickert. Yes, I just wanted to say, Brenda, how sorry I am. And I, my heart is, I'm, I want to reach out to you and tell you I'm really sorry. And um, this morning we had a special mental health board meeting, and one of the um, things that um, I am co confident that M Miguel Rodriguez is going to um, um, put a lot of more emphasis on is on the comorbidity issue of a dual diagnosis of mental health and substance abuse. So that's something I, I'm going to continue to really push for myself, and uh, hopefully our department will too. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Monique, please. Good morning, board. Hello, fellow constituents. My name is Monique Willeen, and I've been coming in every, <laughs> every Tuesday since September 19, 2017. And on that day, Brenda stood up here and shared her heart with you guys and begged of you, please help her help her daughter because she didn't want to have to memorialize her daughter who would have eventually died on the streets. Do you hear me? She was one of those two that are lost to us this last week. And all I can say is this last week, our hearts have been broken. So when I first came in here, I felt in my heart, gosh, Mm, a tyrannical letter that you want us to sign to try and help our people. How dare you? But then I had a conversation with Mr. Cruz, and I thank you for helping my mind set it straight. And I understand this is a, an umbrella phrase letter to show policy. And all I'm asking for, because we've been coming in for six years every single Tuesday, and it's exhausting. But I have been fighting so Leanne's life would not be in vain. I wanted my mother's life to be the sacrifice. So Whoa, as weird. I invite you to come with us on the park on Saturdays, Mrs. Birch, thank you. We had three board of directors at the park this weekend because we felt we want to do what Jesus does. We don't want to hand out a fish. We want to teach people how to fish. So we had incredible conversations about how to connect people to services. I make no money from this. I want no money from this. I have raised two children that are not mine, and they're both now successful, graduated high school, have their own apartments, and both sets of children have come back to tell me thank you because they were my children's friends. So what it takes is a deep-hearted conversation, a non-judgmental listening, a perspective of understanding where someone is at to get to the heart of the, pr of the problem. This involves a whole lot of unprocessed traumas as to why people are homeless in the first place. And the longer you are homeless or underserved and unsheltered, the more difficult it is to get your stuff together to get out of it. So if we can be honest and have unabashed conversations to figure out why people are out there, then we can do this. And since I get a sense of collective unity that if we sign this paper, we can get this done. So I'm asking everybody, thank you for the Hope Van, everybody in this room, please, can we work together? Can we get a bigger think tank? Because if I say something that inspires you, and you say something that inspires her, and she says something that inspires her, then we can fix this very difficult, deep-seated problem. Thank you. Thank you. So not for nothing, the whole time we've been watching this, this the conversation at these meetings has been dominated by anti-vaxxers and domestic terrorists. And lost in the shuffle has essentially been these two ladies who, in the, the chaos of what we were watching before, we probably ended up lumping in with the other maniacs, uh, wrongly, apparently, 
<clears throat> and they were just trying to help people, but they, they couldn't do, they couldn't even break through the noise because of the absolute insanity that was happening at this board of supervisors meeting over the last two years. Maybe not just the last two years. They had a whole chemtrails meeting at this board of supervisors in like 2012. Monique. Monique. Hold on. Thank you for what you do on Saturdays. Thank you. And the people that are helping you out there. That is a wonderful organization that you're it just, you're actually getting people. It's, it's amazing. I just want to give you the public thank you with that, okay? Thank you, Supervisor. Would anybody else like to address the board this morning? Please come on down and if there's anybody else, uh, just go ahead and get in queue and we'll receive you as you come forward. Um, I wanted to thank Tim for going down and really finding out what was going on. And I want to thank the entire board for what I believe to be your very serious consideration of this. And I think it was very important, and I think it was important for the people to know what was going on with this. And I also agree with uh, Supervisor Jones in that we need to work on things in order to make sure that they are moving things in a positive direction and that we are getting some improvement. But anyway, I want to thank you all for, I think, you know, very serious consideration that you've done here today. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone I can't believe what we're watching. To address the board. I'm stunned. One last call. Very good. We'll, uh, we'll bring it back to the board. Supervisor Comente. I want to put my mic on. Um, I just want to share that this money is also um, used for the CERT, um, the Crisis Intervention Response Team, which is one of the most innovative things that law enforcement can do to create that sensitivity that often police officers don't have just because of the nature of their business and, and really couple them with a social worker to get the necessary sensitivity for dealing with these very difficult situations. What I the really fuck? Is Shasta and County defunding the cops and adding social workers? Or, I, I, what time, the how fuck? Much I appreciate as I step off this board to see this community come back together because I unfortunately witnessed this community when it was very, very divided. And I really want this community to come back together. We are a great community. We have wonderful, compassionate people. It's okay if we disagree. We can have our political disagreements. We can have our religious disagreements. We can have a disagreement or sports teams. We can disagree with all that stuff, but we all have to agree that we share this community together and that we have a lot of work to do. And I think this is the common ground that we can all focus on. And I and I am, am, am very gladdened as I see this come together, and I'm very glad that it, that appears we'll get a 5-0 vote on this. So, um, so thank you. Thank you, community. Thank you, board. That's all I have, sir. Well stated. Supervisor Rickard. Yes, I'd just like to make a motion. That, I'll second. That we... Uh, should I read it all, or can sure. I just say make a motion you for can approval? Just, Tim's already in, so I think we're good. <laughs> okay, I didn't know. If, but anyway, I'd like to be the one to make the motion, because it's really important to me, as you all know, if this is something that we need to get keep working on as hard as we can. Uh, so motion and second by Supervisor Garman over here. Any additional uh, conversation from board members? Supervi uh, Supervisor, I just demoted you. Uh, Mr. Cruz. Mm. And just to uh, to clarify the, the the motion, the motion is, as I understand, it would be for the board to direct the Shasta County Housing and Community Action Agency director to sign the guidance letter at issue. Yes, exactly what I heard her say. That's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> and you agree with that? That's motion. it. Thank you so much. Just a, uh, a closing comment from myself. Uh, while we understand that uh, this is a uh, more than a bit of grandstanding by our governor, the bottom line is. Our focus, our focus hasn't changed at all. In fact, I think, if anything, no. The focus of the board of supervisors meeting seems to have changed dramatically since the last time we checked in on it. Actually, it has helped to fine tune the focus. Uh, Robert, uh, you have. Are you still in the room here? You've continued to mention over the over the years here, and in your comments that we need to come together in terms of not just government, but in the private organization, nonprofit sector. And it really pleases me to, to see so many that are not just here in this room, but in Chasta County. I don't have the total number, but I know that it's dozens and dozens of agencies that focus on helping those in need with special needs uh, that have challenges with having even food or a place to stay. Uh, together, uh, all of those entities make a huge difference. Megan, seeing you in the room today, 
uh, reminds me of your assistance over the years in, in placing 26 little babies in our home. And it's, uh, it's something I'm forever grateful for to have the opportunity to take care of the most vulnerable uh, folks in the county. Is that guy saying he adopted 26 babies? Because that sounds like a bad idea, These are having, children having one person adopt 26 babies. Homelessness is thrust upon them because of the mistakes of their families or parents. And as a community, we could either ignore this population, we could ignore the adult homeless population, the mentally ill adult population, those who maybe don't have the ability to make sound decisions, or we can recognize that we have the ability to help them. Joe, your, your comments are just absolutely spot on, as Supervisor Kehoe would have said many, many years ago, uh, to come together for the same purpose, to make a difference. Uh, my hat is off to not only the county and government agencies, city agencies, but also especially to the various nonprofits, churches, people who get out on a Saturday morning and uh, take food from their kitchens and feed those in need. I get a little emotional about that, but I watch your pictures and I see friends that I know that are doing the same and I'm thrilled to be surrounded by several hundred of like-minded people who over not the for nothing in other places places that we think of as more progressive like Santa, uh, san diego and la county sometimes people have been arrested for feeding the homeless people at a park years have planted vegetables uh, delivered gifts food to homes food to homeless camps to help those in needs um, in need and uh, i'm just grateful for every person who invests their heart in another person in Shasta County. You are making a difference. Don't doubt it. And thank you for uh, taking the time to be here today. Supervisor Rickard. Yes, and, and you just triggered a thought to, when you mentioned that, that foster children didn't choose to be foster children. People that have mental illness did not choose to have mental illness. And I think this is something that um, it's really important, wearing my NAMI hat, that we need to continue to break down the stigma surrounding mental illness. It's just something that is imperative that we as a community understand that people do not choose. They do not choose to have a brain disorder, no, no more than a person that would choose to have cancer or diabetes. It's not a choice. So, so um, with that, I just want to emphasize that this is a really important day for Shasta County, that we could come together, that we show unity, and that we show that we can work together and we can try and improve our communities uh, throughout the county. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. And to emphasize that unity, I'm going to call for a roll call vote, please. Supervisor Comenti? Yes. Supervisor Garman? Yes. Supervisor Rickert? Yes. Supervisor Jones? Yes. And Supervisor Baugh? Absolutely yes. Folks, we are adjourned. Thank you for attending today. I can't believe what we just watched. I was like, I was like ready for like Shasta County Board of Supervisors, anti-vaxxers yelling at people, talking about the Great Reset. I was ready for more of the same, and we got not more of the same. <clears throat> Just one thing real quick. I think a lot of times when people talk about homelessness and mental illness, I think they do get the car going the wrong way. I think that a lot of people end up on the street or end up homeless, and then that causes mental illness, mental distress. And maybe had they never become homeless, they would have never been diagnosable as mentally ill. And I think that, uh, I think that people need to think about that a little bit more as uh, when we talk about homelessness, uh, drug addiction and mental illness. But other than that, I think this was like the most uplifting thing I've ever seen happen at the Shasta County Board of Supervisors and uh, good on them. It was very surprising. And uh, podcast listeners, thank you for tuning into Down Ballot. We do the show live every uh, Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. Pacific. Uh, live viewers, stick around. We've got local love coming up soon. I'll be handing over the hosting duties to Chip DeVille. we got interview, live performance, and um, this is Locals by Audible Smoke. We'll be back in uh, 10 minutes, something like that. <laughs> Yeah.
time to get the party started Pick up my phone just to check and see who's calling Dress up real nice for the ladies at the bar And I'm driving in my car just to get to where they are Here at the local scene is where I plant my feet It's where I smoke my cigarette and I hold my drink I look at all my friends, they're all blazing greens Here at the front of the stage waiting for MTV Where are those guys who's standing next to me With a pipe in his hand ready to blaze for me About five minutes later we're all singing queen Let's get the fuck up on stage and rock the scene, yeah We do what we want And what we want is to jam So sit back and enjoy the band We do what we want And what we want is to jam So sit back and enjoy the band Enjoy the band I turn and head back to the bar For a refill, man Cause you know where we are We're headed out to the car To smoke another one Whoa. And another one Whoa. Now just when the magic starts kicking in Now here we left playing And you know it's time to head in Alright everybody now it's time to grab a new drink Spark it if you got it And then pass it to me yeah. We do what we want And what we want is to jam So sit back and enjoy the band Do what we want, what we want to do, and what we want is to jam. So sit back and enjoy the band, enjoy that band. Last up on the bill for the show tonight is down and dirty and five, so we're headed outside to spark up another joint. Now who's got my light? A stoner E, of course. Shouldn't you be inside? I'm all up in this bitch, being who I gotta be. I'm fucked up like the U.S. economy. The truth is, is that I don't. Think Logically, stone to eat, take you on a psychedelic odyssey. Now inside, motherfuckers is rocking me, and outside, shit, we smoke a lot of broccoli. Rocky the roller, you're the sexy girl, be jocking me. Ain't too drunk to fuck, but I'll probably do it sloppily. We do what we want, what we wanna do, and what we want is to jam. So sit back and enjoy the band. Dance, 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 And what we want is to jam So sit back and enjoy the band Yeah, All they say They hear like jamming And they hope it like jamming too Well, I gotta say Thank you, Bob, we do Yes, I gotta say Thank you, Bob, we do Well, Bob Marley said They hear like jamming And they hope it like jamming too Well, I gotta say Thank you, Bob, we do Yes, I gotta say Thank you, Bob, we do